Well, hello there. If you're expecting Pastor Ray uh, today, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, he will not be with us today. Don't know if you knew, but uh, Pastor Ray is having surgery uh, this coming Friday. Uh, I believe it's the 29th of this of January. So uh, the elders decided to give him a little time off to not only recuperate, but uh, to get himself uh, prepared for the rest of the year. So, uh, of course, we, we miss him, and we miss him well. So please uh, keep him and his family in your prayers as, uh, as we move forward. So I'm Steve Frenzemeyer. Uh, I'm one of the elders here at, at First Christian Church. And so uh, thank you for being with us and uh, hope you uh, can get something out of, uh, out of our uh, time together today. So don't know how true this story is or not, but it's a story that I once heard about during World War II, there was a British Army regiment that was stationed in North Africa during the war. And during this time, they marched up and down North Africa for days and weeks all in time where they didn't, hardly had anything to eat. They didn't have time to shower. They didn't have time to change clothes. And these guys were tired. They were wore out. They'd been in battles. They'd won some and they lost some. And the guys were just beat up, tired, hungry, dirty and messy, and just needed a break. So finally, one day, the, the their commanding officer stopped the troops and said, troops, I have good news and some bad news for you. He said, first, the good news. The good news is you all get a change of underwear. The troops just go wild. You know, they're just, <clears throat> the anticipation of, of uh, having fresh underwear was just on their mind. And he said, and now the bad news. The bad news is you change with you and you change with you and you change with you. Needless to say, their uh, expectations were just kind of busted. You know, but sometimes change requires a lot of us. And sometimes change is not always all that comfortable because we have to give up something and we have to trade in something for it. It's a real, not a very good thing. The good thing is, is a lot of us want to see good change happen and it's welcomed until it comes to us as individuals. You know, as a country this past year, we've seen a lot of uh, extremely rough and sad days. And uh, depending on which political party you're affiliated with, you know, either the good days are ahead of us or the good days are over. You know, we've seen rioting in our U.S. Capitol a couple of weeks ago. We're seeing riots in, in Seattle, Washington. We're seeing the division between our country becoming more and more real each and every day. There's Republicans, there's Democrats, there's a right, there's a left, there's conservatives, and there's liberals, and the list just goes on and on and on. And all of this has truly divided our country. And many of us and many people have been asking for unity. We have heard it so many times these past few weeks with all the inauguration speeches and all the new uh, candidates coming into office. Some believe that legislation will solve the problems. Some think a new administration will take care of our uh, nation's problems. We can legislate from now until whenever. New ad administrations will come and go and nothing Literally nothing can solve the problems that we are seeing in our country today, except for one thing, and one thing only. A people that cries out to the Almighty God and asks Him for His will to be done in this place. In order for us to change, we first must come to the determination that there must be a better way of doing things. That the way we are on right now just this isn't right, that things are going in a bad direction. There must be, there has to be something better than this. It's a time for us to draw a line in the sand and say, I cannot do this anymore. Something has to change. So we're going to read from Second Chronicles verse seven, uh, chapter 7, verse 14. And this is God speaking. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive them 
and I'll heal their land. You know, often when we hear this verse, we think that uh, God is talking during some really, really bad times in Israel. You know, when his people have totally gone their own ways, doing their own things, and they just have no care for God at all. But let me give you a little background on this verse. God is speaking to his chosen people, Israel. And right now, in this particular time of history, they have just finished a celebration of the completion of Solomon's temple. And it was a temple that Solomon built for God. Times were good. And they weren't only good, times were great. I mean, Israel had just finished a celebration of this temple. Israel was finally united. And now, when I say a celebration, I mean this was a celebration. It was a three-week three celebration. And during this time, Solomon himself sacrificed 22,000 head of cattle and 120 sheep and goats. And he sacrificed these all to the Lord. That's, that's a lot of livestock right there. There was singing, <clears throat> there was dancing, prayers, and consecration. And for Israel, man, it just didn't get any better than this. And yet God said what he said to him in verse 14. Times were good. Israel w was united. And things literally couldn't be any better than what they were then. But I believe what God was saying to Israel it was a promise and a reminder. Without him, there would be pride. There would be division amongst the people and people turning their backs on God. Does that sound familiar in these days, in these times? Does that sound familiar? But God offers us a framework for change so that God can bless us. The first thing we need to do is we need to be a people of humility. The first thing we need to do is to have to have real lot, uh, change in our lives and in our nation <clears throat> is to humble ourselves. 1 Peter 5 verse 6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. So what's due time? His help will come at the right time. God will show up at the right time. Let's view humility this way. There's only one God. Only one God. And it isn't me. And it isn't you. When we come to the creator of the universe and the creator of everything in it, <clears throat> our natural response should to be fall to fall on our knees in humility. Humility allows us to place God in his rightful position on the throne of our lives and on our land, yielding our will to his. Psalms 25 verses 8 and 9 say, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. If we hold on to pride in ourselves, and we aren't allowing God the opportunity to teach and to mold us into what Christ wants us to be. Whose image would you rather be in? Your own or in Jesus Christ? Me, a sinner, my image, or the perfect, sinless, blameless image of Jesus? The second thing we need to do is be a people of prayer. <clears throat> For there to be true change in our life and in our country, we need to be a people, be a person dedicated to prayer. Spending conversation time with the Lord. Notice prayer is a conversation. Not a one-way sided dialogue from us to Him and expressing our wish list to Him, but rather it's our conversation with us and God and God to us. Philippians 4, verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, 
by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present, present your requests to God. God does not only want to hear our requests, but prayer is so much more than just saying those requests. Prayer is a humble conversation with God. Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, verses 5 through 7, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, as they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Prayer is a big deal to God. And in his scriptures, prayer is referred to over 360 times throughout the scriptures as something being important to him. Prayer begins the process of change. Prayer is a time for us to talk to God, to share our hearts with him, our fears, our joys, and our dreams. And then prayer is also a time to listen to God so he can share his will for us. The third thing we need to do is to be a people seeking God's face. Now, what does it really mean to seek God's face? Let's put it this way. During this pandemic, <clears throat> we had to learn a whole new way to communicate. We had virtual visits, you remember? Zoom meetings, FaceTime, all those different methods became popular ways of having in-person meetings without really meeting in person. It was virtual. It was not real. Now, I could see you on the screen, and you could see me on the screen, but we're not together. We had virtual meetings for work, for meetings for church, and some of us even had virtual meetings with our families. Our family had several virtual family reunions <clears throat> over the past 10 months. The virtual meetings were very good. I mean, they were at least we got to keep in contact with people. It was good to see family and friends and to catch up with them. But seeing them virtually just exactly wasn't the same as being in person, being sitting at the same table with them, being in the same room together. It just wasn't the same. Because I think when we can really look eye to eye with people, you know, that's when there's the connection happens. That's when you can look into their eyes and you can see their soul and you see their heart. The same is true with God. The more time we spend in close proximity with him, the more we get to see him, to see his heart. I love the way Daniel, uh, Danielle Burnock puts it this way. She said, to seek God's face is to seek a, seek a deeper relationship with him. This is done not only through prayer, but also through worship. Those who seek the face of God will not be disappointed. Psalms 27, verse 8 says, this is David speaking, My heart says of you, speaking to God, Seek his face, your face, Lord, I will seek. And then Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You, and this is God speaking, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. You know, seeking God is not just a, oh, a passe type of thing. We're just going to, I'll give it a shot. God wants our whole heart in it, to seek him. Seeking God's face is also seeking the heart of God, which is, allows us to truly know who God is, to know his character, to know, I mean, we all know that God's good, you know, that God's love. But we can experience that personally and see how God does that. Daniel uh, excuse me, David was considered a man after God's own heart. You know, when my days on this earth on, are over, I would like to be known as a man after God's own heart. And I'm sure as Christians that all of us would like to be known 
as a people after God's own heart. But you know, some of us are going to be totally satisfied with Jesus just as our Savior. And some will be satisfied with Jesus being our Savior and our Lord. And not to dive any deeper than that. You know, Jesus, you've done all the important stuff, and thank you. And that's, that's good enough. So much more that God wants us to have with him than just that. I love the lyrics to the old hymn that say, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things on earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The fourth thing that we need to do is we need to be a people that repents. Repentance is a true change of one's mind. Repentance allows us to realize that we're on the wrong path, a path that doesn't coincide with God's will. Biblical repentance is changing our mind from rejection of Christ to walking in faith with Christ. Acts 20, 21 says, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus, says Paul. And then Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 13, verse 3, But unless you repent, you too will perish. Now, if we don't repent, we're not allowing the opportunity for God to work in our lives because we're saying that we're right, that there's nothing wrong, that I all the decisions that I've made are good. Thank you, God, but I've done this on my own. Where has that gotten you? Doing things on your own. Doing the things that you want to do. I'm sure at times that was good, but where did that truly get you? Doing everything that you wanted all the time. Did it get you in trouble? Did you make bad decisions? Yeah, I know I have. In order to repent, the first thing we have to do is, is be humble. I mean, that's kind of a resounding theme here today, isn't it? We may have prayed already and looked for God's face, in God's face, but if we don't repent, repent, all that work that we just did, that we just did, has been for nothing. Repentance is admitting that my way is wrong and God's way is right. Let's face it, God's way is right. It's better. It's the best. No matter what we think is best for us, God knows what's best for us even more. Proverbs 14, verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. Because with this, we're relying on our own wisdom, our own smarts. And what seems may seem right to us isn't right to God. Because when, we th when we're thinking what's best for us, there's always a selfish ambition to it. But when it comes to God, it's what's best for us. Always what's best for us. I hope that you can see that repentance is essential to allowing God to do the work in our lives that he wants to do, the stuff that he wants to happen. But we're just too prideful to admit it. Let's just admit this. We can't do this, live life on earth, on our own. Whether you're a Christian or not, you just can't do it on your own. We need help. We need God's not only intervention, but we need God's direction for us as individuals, as, as a church, as families, and as a country. We need God. When we do these four things, <clears throat> the Lord says he will heal our land. So what does that healing look like? Is it economic healing? Possibly. Is it physical healing? Possibly. 
But I think more so than any kind of physical and economic healing that goes on, God wants us to heal our relationship with him. God wants us to be reconciled back to himself. And that's a great place to be, reconciled with God. Every year, every single year, the president of our United States gives what is called the State of the Union Address. In this address, no matter who the president is, they tout and they brag about all that their administration has done and accomplished. <coughs> and then they always blame someone, usually the opposing political party, for all the things that went wrong. They push their own agendas, all the things that they want to do. That's what they talk about. I did this. I did that. Under my leadership, we are going to do all these great things. And throughout their speech, they seem to never truly address the real problems that our country is facing. They may throw out a scripture from the Bible that they think will uh, give some godly credence to their cause. But in the scheme of things, God really is nowhere in the plan for our country. It's a speech full of pride, beating our own chest, what we've done, and playing the blame game. Now, what if we did a similar speech, a State of the Union address for ourselves? Let's call it the state of my heart. Now, this speech is a little bit different. It's not for the entire American public. It's not for your family. It's not for the church. It's not for a group of people. There's only one thing, person in this audience, and that's God. So for a moment, whether you're a Christian or not, can we put aside our pride? Can we humble ourselves before God being completely real, completely transparent with him, and telling him what's going on in our lives, what's good, what's bad, without blaming anyone and asking God for his will to be done. We all want God to heal our country. But to heal our country, it starts with the, life, the lives of God's children. So today, right now, this very moment, can we humble ourselves, pray, and seek God's face, and then repent? And then let God do what he does best, and that's being God. That's loving us, that's taking care of us, healing us, and guiding our lives so we can have the best lives that he wants us to have. God loves us. To heal his land, it starts here with me. It starts with you. Let's be real with God. Let's be authentic with him. Let God do the rest. But we have to first, we have to put him in a place where he can do those things. Allow God to be God. And allow him to change this nation. And allow it to begin with me. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the way that you love us. I thank you for giving your son. And God, as your people, we ask that you come and that you heal our nation because there is such division. We are not a country that's a Christian country anymore, but we've sold out to so many other things. And God, in some of us in our lives, we may have been a Christian at one time or we may have never been a Christian, but we've sold out to other things. Lord, Allow us to be humble. Let us seek your face. And forgive us, Lord. Forgive us of turning our backs on you. We want to be a people that, that's yours. We want to be your people. We want our country to be yours. 
so that when we say, God bless America, we can also say, America blesses God. God, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.